During nearly all of human evolutionary history, that's about 200,000 years, half a billion to one billion people living on the planet. Today there are eight billion people on the planet, so we've gone from one billion to eight billion. Of course we're impacting the world. All of the waste that we produce, all of the resources that we need, all of the energy that we consume, distributed over the whole planet, um, and, and building our cities and urban environments. And if you look forward just another 30, 40 years, there'll be an extra two billion people on the planet joining us with current projections. So 10 billion people on the planet. How on earth are we going to manage uh, with this large population and live successfully with the rest of, of nature? And that really is the fundamental challenge that the European Centre is, is addressing, trying to take different aspects of it and uh, find out information, gain insights that we can then use to help us live sustainably. Ten years ago when we started the centre, these ideas were nascent, there were definitely ideas around that we should be taking a more complex approach to the environment and health, but still typically these things were siloed, so in environmental science and environmental government departments did environment things and likewise with health. And actually to genuinely integrate these things, we need to understand these complex interactions. We need to allow for the fact that there are both risks and benefits from the environment for our health. We need to consider how we are impacting on the environment. So that's kind of baked into the ethos of the centre right from the outset. And I think the last 10 years has really seen that field come on. The aim of the centre has always been to bring together people from psychology, sociology, geography, health services research, microbiologists and on um, to try and understand these really complex problems that we have thinking about the connections between environment and health in a changing world of, of climate change and population growth and all those other big issues to really try and work together in innovative and productive ways. One of the things that we did a few years ago is we uh, looked at a data set from Natural England called the Monitor of Engagement with the Natural Environment Survey. And what we did was work out what volume of physical activity people did in all natural environments across England. So for example, walking in a park, running by a river, and we try and make an economic estimate of how much all that physical activity is worth in terms of cost savings uh, to the National Health Service in England. And actually we calculated that figure around £2.2 .2 billion in annual savings per year. Locally relevant and nationally important research is an important aspect of, of what we do and I think the uh, the impact of what we have, we can point to the achievement of becoming a WHO collaborating centre uh, within, the, within the first 10 years of our um, operations and we have recently with the WHO provided a report that's been launched across the whole of Europe for ministers around biodiversity and health and the connections between uh, the policy planning for health and also environment and the need for those two areas to come together. And I think the, the other pointer I think that is, reflects the national importance and recognition of the centre is the a number of approaches we now have from international partners to participate in research activities and uh, conferences and other events. We have a thriving public engagement group, for example, so it's really important that we work with communities uh, and the public. We all have our own connections um, to policy and that's uh, in, on a local level to local councils or in my work um, in the Caribbean in the Pacific to local um, governance structures and their community leaders. As this interdisciplinary group we learn really to translate what we are doing for very broad audiences and I think that is really important to reach um, policy makers on all different levels. The world's uh, top five influential climate scientists in the UK are at the University of Exeter. And if you put that together with our WHO collaborating uh, centre, which is really looking at uh, green space and wellbeing and public health, 
you've got a huge powerful force that can join together to work with partners and policy makers to really make change happen and very much what our centre is doing is bringing the people together not only to conduct world leading research you know, top five in the world for green space and public health but critically work with external partners and policy makers to create real solutions to the critical challenges that we all face. The thing that strikes me about the centre is that they use the same rigorous scientific approaches that the university would expect in any discipline, applying it to the discipline of environment and human health, which is in fact very difficult. A lot of the things that need to be measured are difficult to measure and the outcomes are difficult to measure. But the centre has applied international standards, scientific rigour, and of course that's necessary in order for the research to be trusted and for order, in order for the results to be used. And I think again we should applaud the approach that's been taken here to the science um, and that has really paid dividends. One issue is that policy takes a long time and it doesn't just take evidence, it also takes interest and um, effort on the part of people who are affected by those policies. But I would say in 10 years we've had actually a remarkable impact on certain areas. In particular, antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, Will Gaze and his group, with many collaborators around the world, have actually put this issue of antimicrobial resistance and how we, how we use antibiotics both in hospitals but also, for example, in animal feed and how it gets dumped into the environment. They've put that on the map and now there are increasingly policies, laws, regulations around how we use antibiotics. We've taken it for granted that infectious disease is something that we've solved essentially um, in high income countries. We think well infectious disease is something that happens in low and middle income countries and the Covid pandemic has shown us that that is not the case. Um, and that still that we are very vulnerable to um, microbial infections and bacterial infections already kill tens of thousands of people a year in the UK and that's predicted to increase by a factor of 10. So maybe hundreds of thousands of people dying every year in the UK. So it's like COVID every year forever. And you know, if we get to the point where bacteria become pan resistant to antibiotics, so we have no usable antibiotics, which is already the case for some pathogens. So all People have died from pan-resistant infections where every single antibiotic has been tried and there's nothing that we can do. So if that becomes more widespread, you know, that is the scenario that we're talking about. So I've been working on understanding why and how antibiotic-resistant bacteria end up in coastal bathing waters um, using metagenomics um, and culture-based techniques. This research has been really important for um, informing policy because it shows that there's a potential link between uh, contamination of the environment with antibiotic resistant bacteria and a health effect in humans who are exposed to those environments. And carriage of antibiotic resistant bacteria could lead to subsequent infections in those people or uh, to pass on those resistant bacteria to more vulnerable people in the population. So it's already informed the UK government's five-year antimicrobial resistance strategy from 2019 to 2024 and has been cited by the, um, the World Health Organization's review of bathing water quality. In less than 10 years, we've also had an impact on how people view the natural environment. A lot of the research has always has gone towards what are the risks? You know, what, what, how is the natural environment going to hurt me? What we've done with our research is create an evidence base that interacting with natural environments is good for your health and well-being, both in terms of preventing illness, but also potentially treating it. And I think our work with um, DEFRA and the WHO has brought fruit so that people are now taking that benefit into account when they have laws around how to interact with the natural environment going forward. There are relatively few medical schools who have teaching facilities that do what we do and how we do it. Going forward, the importance of medical students understanding about the impact of the environment on patients' health, on keeping them healthy, 
on well-being, a term which 10 years ago was to a certain extent ridiculed and people looked down their noses at the concept. But now we actually are beginning to understand that natural capital has a major impact on your health and well-being. I'm so proud that we went from literally nothing to a group of people who work together both as a research and training unit but also collaboratively with many different colleagues and communities around the world to make a difference around how we interact with the natural environment in the future. It's important to be alert to new uh, threats uh, and new opportunities for that matter. And I think that's also in the ethos of, of the centre. Now we're moving on into other areas and uh, we constantly need to do that. What are the next problems coming down the line? We've got an outlet for changing policy. We've got an outlet for looking at climate modelling and how that's going to impact health. So I think it's about taking those, those opportunities and those collaborations we've forged and really making the most of them going forward and looking at future focused research in environment and health. It's always so critical that when you're looking at these issues as a young person that you're coming from an evidence-based place because that's when you have the, the kind of knowledge to support what you're saying and the, the power behind what you're saying. What I really hope is that we can continue to play a role and keep this at the top of the political agenda um, and do that by creating novel, um, innovative and cutting-edge academic evidence.